थ्री टू वन स्टार्ट थैंक यू warm welcome to the 42nd webinar of the pediatric orthopedic society of india the topic for the today's webinar is not a very high fi topic but we have selected a topic which is useful to everyone in day to day practice and today's session is about the challenging everyday trauma cases we are really fortunate to have eminent and experienced faculty for this meeting we have three faculty from north america and two experts from india i will give a short introduction about them the michael bush is uh, from the children's healthcare of atlanta previously that was a scottish right atlanta now it is called children's healthcare of atlanta he is pioneer in pediatric uh, sports medicine and he was the first few people who did the dedicated fellowship in pediatric uh, sports medicine at present is the head of the pediatric orthopedic fellowship at the same center over and about the orthopedics he has a interest in surfing and golf also the second faculty is steven frick we already know him because he visited the uh, silver jubilee posicon in mumbai at present he is a professor of orthopedic surgery at stanford children's healthcare he was a past president of bosna and before joining stanford he was at numerous children hospital orlando he has a interest in trauma foot and ankle and neuromuscular condition we have a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon crystal perkins she is also at the children's healthcare of atlanta over and above orthopedics she has a keen interest in marathon and triathlon and because of his sports background she likes to help the people the people who are active in sports so that they can return to sport pediatric trauma is again her special interest we have another expert from india dr p n gupta he is head at uh, municipal medical college at chandigarh he was vice president of posi and recently he received an award a prestigious joseph jory award for 2020 uh, and he is supposed to visit uh, usa as soon as the covid situation is under control the second expert from india is dr binoti shet she is professor and head at lokmanya hospital mumbai she is recipient of sicot awards and she has published three books these are the two books for the undergraduate students for orthopedic and recently they came out the three author binoti sandeep and mandar they published a very interesting book pediatric orthopedic trauma protocols and technique so with this expert faculty i am going to give you brief background about the format of webinar in this webinar we don't have any didactic lectures we are going to have a interesting case so first of all faculty will present one case will give us a brief background about the case and then we will have a interaction amongst the panelists about the treatment and what can be done and then we will have a short review of literature related to that case if you have any question during the discussion you can whatsapp your question to sandeep on his mobile number 982306398 I repeat nine eight two three zero six three nine eight nine. Before I hand over to our experts, I just would like to remind you that you can review this webinar or all the previous webinars on the POSI website, or to see this webinar, the same link on which you are seeing, you can review this webinar also. Regarding the upcoming program next month, we are starting a new session. and that is how do i do it and for that we have selected two very common topics eight plate and percutaneous epiphysiodesis by transepiphyseal screw and we are really fortunate to have two experts for these session peter stevens is going to speak about how he prefers to do eight plate and james sanders is going to speak about pets so that session is on 25th august wednesday so with this short introduction i stop sharing and i hand over to steve to take over
over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, wish that I was with all of you uh, in India. I had a great time at uh, PosiCon, and uh, I'm going to present uh, some super common humerus fracture cases, which we all um, deal with, and uh, I will hopefully you all can see my screen. Yes, perfect. So, yeah. So a nine-year-old uh, presents with these uh, radiographs, uh, right-hand dominant fall from a playground uh, equipment and uh, has no neurological deficits, um, but puckering of the skin noted um, and uh, has a good pulse. Uh, this is what the um, fracture looks like in the emergency department on the, your left. And uh, um, in our hospital, uh, we happen to be doing a a couple of transplants at the same time that this kid came in. So I couldn't get to the operating room uh, emergently. Uh, but for me, if you have this brachialis sign um, and dimpling of the skin, I like to not wait. And I just go to the operating room as soon as the OR can get a room available for me. So we ended up doing that at uh, two in the morning. And I think that this picture from Edward Abraham groups kind of shows what happens in these severe supracondylars where the proximal fragment comes out and goes through the brachialis muscle to create this so-called brachialis sign of antecubital ecchymosis, skin dimpling, puckering, and then you can palpate that subcutaneous bone fragment. And the purpose of this case is really to just talk about this. So I think it's really important to know how to do the milking maneuver if you're gonna take care of pediatric elbow trauma and different ways to do it. This shows both hands sort of pushing the brachialis down with the thumbs. Um, this is really the way that I tend to do it, which is to grab the arm uh, medially and laterally and pull the brachialis up so that you can try to get the spike of bone to go back down underneath the muscle. And then you get a good reduction and you do a uh, good penning. So this is what my uh, reduction and pen construct looks like. Uh, pretty typical for me. Three lateral entry pins with good pin spread. And this child's nine years old. So for me, older than eight years old or more than 20 kilograms, I use a bigger pin. So instead of a six, two inch wire or 1.6 millimeter wire, I increase the size to a two millimeter wire. Um, and I think I interoperatively, I try to assess two things. I'm not in extension. So the anterior humeral line intersects the capitellum and I'm not in varus. So that Bauman's angle is in some valgus. Um, I think really important to know what an acceptable reduction is. So for me, it can be rotated, it can be displaced or translated, but I don't want varus and I don't want extension. Um, this is the pen construct. For me, I make it simple and I just, uh, I just draw lines and divide it into one third. And I want one pen to cross in the medial third, another pen to cross in the lateral third. And if it's really unstable, I'll put one in the middle. I put them in a cast like this. I uh, extend the elbow uh, so that it's not at 90 degrees, usually 80 degrees or 70 degrees of flexion. I split the cast on one side. I spread it and put some little spacers in it to accommodate swelling. So um, that's the first case, uh, how to handle the brachialis sign. So comments from Dr. Gupta. Yeah, I agree with you, Steve, uh, that uh, for a patient with a brachialis interposition, my preference would be again uh, to do it as early as feasible, but uh, certainly I will not do it at 2 a.m. I would wait till uh, the next day. I mean, after 12 or 1, uh, my team and everybody becomes a little clumsy. So unless it's a unless it's a vascular emergency, I would wait for the next day. Uh, as far as the pin construct is concerned, I think uh, most of the cases for. Uh, Type three, we would uh, go in for three pins. And most of the times these are lateral three pins, but if there is a medial obliquity, then sometimes, you know, you, I'll go in with a medial pin, one or two couple, I mean, one pa particular patient with a very small uh, uh, lateral side and a big medial side. So medial oblique fracture uh, to go for uh, at least two pins from the medial side because only one pin was possible from the lateral side. So what's your view about that? Do you take care of the obliquity part? Do you factor in that or uh, do you always- Yeah, absolutely. Do... I think that's a great point. And for me, same thing, if it's, a, it's an oblique fracture, so 
you know, it's uh, low on the lateral side and high on the medial side, then a medial pen makes a lot of sense to me. The other thing is a lot of comminution. So sometimes I'll, uh, um, if I think that the fracture is really unstable, I'll put uh, two lateral and one medial pen in if I think I have a lot of comminution. Yeah, I think I'll agree that in, in, in patients where there's a lot of comminution, I would again go with a one medial pin, uh, with two lateral pins. And if it is stable enough, if you feel that the construct is stable enough, then you, most of the times it is three lateral pins. Great. Do, so you, do, you, use a, do you use a pin like a Dorgan's uh, uh, pin ev ever? Yeah, I'm not like, a uh, from fan. The, um, uh, I think it's stopped. hard to put that pin in. That, that pin goes from high, you know, proximal, lateral, down to medial. Yeah. yeah. And I think it, uh, I've seen cases with the radial nerve pinned by that pin. Okay. So I think that uh, if I'm going to, if I need a pin that is in that orientation, I'd rather put a medial pin in. And I think the tips for putting a medial pin in for me are um, usually I have one and often two lateral pins in, and then I straighten the elbow out a little bit so yes. that the ulnar nerve is not subluxated over the medial epicondyle. And I usually put my thumb on the nerve and push it back. If I can't feel it, if there's too much swelling, then I'll make a small incision. Uh, I also make a small incision if there is a lot of swelling, which usually is. I mean, I've never seen a patient where I can actually palpate the ulnar nerve. Now, uh, Steve, one more thing, which uh, I mean, this is an open discussion to everybody. Do you feel that by using your drill in an oscillating mode rather than a rotating mode, you reduce the chances of ulnar nerve entrapment on the pin? I think on the medial side, anytime you're, you think your pin is near a neurological structure, I think that it's fine to oscillate. I think that's uh, something to keep it from winding up. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little harder to actually sort of feel the bone when you're oscillating. And I prefer when there's no nerves around to just drill forward. But uh, I think on the medial side, that makes sense. Uh, I think I'll do go with the oscillation mode once you're on the uh, epicondyle and then you can just push in your uh, drill a little and then you can actually palpate when your pin is going. Yep, great. So I'm going to show you one quick more supracondylar case just to... Uh, so, uh, so here's this, one that... This is uh, this is a question from Dr. Dhirain. Sure. Do you use electrical stimulation while putting the medial pin? I do not. Uh, I, I do also not. never used. I have never used. So just one more quick case because uh, we have... So Stephen, if I can ask a question to you. Sure. Yes. So what is your upper limit of a delayed presentation where you will try the milking maneuver? Because what happens is that in our country, we never get or sometimes we will have patients coming in two days, three days sure. later with the pucker sign, with the vascular pink hand. So, yeah, I haven't had that experience, but if... If it were really delayed and I felt like the, the soft tissues now are sort of set, then I would probably proceed to an open reduction. And, uh, but it really just depends on how, I don't think there's harm in trying to milk it, you know, if it's one or two days late in its presentation. And, and have, uh, you, have you tried percutaneous leverage techniques? Yeah, I have. I think that if it was the same situation where you're worried that the soft tissues have sort of settled and are, are contracting a little bit and it's been uh, delayed, then I think um, I probably would think that wouldn't work. Um, if if you can do a percutaneous leverage technique, I think I could probably milk it and get it reduced without having to resort to that. But I think those work and the, the percutaneous leverage techniques from the back are, are, I think are safe. All right, okay, thanks. So just one quick, just if you have to open it. So here's one that was pulseless, perfused, had a median nerve palsy was operated on elsewhere. And when the surgeon did the closed reduction, all of a sudden the hand lost perfusion. And they called me in the middle of the night from an outside ER about an hour away or OR and asked me what to do. I said, take the pens out, straighten the elbow out so that you get back to where you started and send them to us emergently. He forgot the part about taking out the pens, but he did straighten the elbow out. We got some perfusion back, um, but I just proceeded to open that. And the purpose of just this case is if you have a brachialis sign, which this child had before, and you do a reduction and either you can't get it reduced or you lose perfusion, that for me is an uh, indication to do an open reduction. And for me, 
I do this exposure. I make a transverse incision just above the anocubital fossa at the level of the fracture. And then I expose, you know, from lateral to medial, this is the brachial, uh, sorry, the biceps tendon and muscle. This is the brachial artery, and this is the median nerve. And so you can get those structures out of the way and then do your reduction. Um, you can also use a Doppler interop. Hopefully you guys can hear that little uh, bruise at the fracture. Very good perfusion on the other side. So, and then the same pen construct, and here's that child later, but for Dr. Gupta, if you need to open a fracture, how do you make your incision? Yeah, again, uh, with a transverse incision, but in my center, most of the times we do it along with the vascular surgeon. So it's perhaps their preference what they want to go. So a lot of times they want to go with a little longitudinal incision so that they can have a look at the artery up and down. So it's their preference, but we go again, uh, the, the deeper dissection is similar. But if I have to go personally, I will consider a transverse incision. Great. And you can see here, I actually extended a little bit. I was looking, I tried to go find the biceps tendon first, and I think I had trouble finding it here. So I extended it a little bit distally. You can extend it distally and proximally, yeah, if you need to, but I start with the transverse incision that usually heals quite beautifully. Anyone else have comments about how they do open reductions? As you said, at our center also, we use a transverse and then extend proximally distally like a C or S. And uh, I just wanted to ask you whether you, do you use any time the color Doppler uh, ultrasound scan or anything like that intraoperatively for? Yeah, I haven't. Um, I know that uh, my colleague uh, from Cincinnati, Chuck Melman, he calls the radiology team and does the color Doppler in the OR. I just use the Doppler at the wrist and the, the group out of Dallas at Texas Scottish Rite had a very large series um, and they use the presence or the absence of a Doppler signal at the wrist as a determinant to determine whether or not they're going to open. So if you have a pulseless perfused supracondylar, no palpable pulse with or without Doppler signal before surgery, after you pin it, if you don't have a good Doppler signal at the wrist, I will then explore the artery. So I just use the regular pencil probe like I showed here. And uh, again, I, I think it's helpful. The, the bone may push these structures way out of where they normally belong. So for me, it's most helpful to go find the biceps tendon, biceps muscle first, and then work my way medially to find the artery and the nerve. Steve, I have one question for you. At any point yes. of time, do you feel that your Doppler gives you a better idea than your clinical evaluation of the nail bed perfusion? Well, I think you still want to have excellent capillary refill in the hand. And yeah. so that probably trumps everything. But um, I don't trust my ability. I usually wear two pairs of gloves to actually palpate the pulse. And so I always... No, no, not, not the pulse, the capillary yeah. refill time. Do you rely more on that or do you rely more on your Doppler? Uh, I like to have good flow in the Doppler. So okay. um, I, I will say that... Um, the paper that I wrote when I was in Charlotte in JBJS, we actually had a few patients who did not have Doppler signal, but had good capillary refill. And those, it's only, it was only two patients in that series, but those patients also did well with just observation and, and without any artery surgery. So uh, capillary refill is probably the most important thing. But for me, I also like having good Doppler flow because what I've found is often the artery just has, um, is kinked or has a, is being pulled by one of its branches and you can free that up and take the pressure off the artery and then improve the flow. Steve, we uh, really should move along to uh, the next case. Perfect. Crystal? So thanks for uh, Posey for having all of us uh, today. Look forward to kind of sharing knowledge all together and learning from each other. So we'll get started here. So the first case I had, uh, continuing on the theme of elbows today, so this is a 15-year-old female who fell. She was standing on a rolling chair uh, by the computer, standing on it, and uh, fell off. And so she was seen by an outside surgeon who had referred her in. And so at this point, she's about five days out from her initial injury. And so she has these radiographs here. 
Um, some of these can be subtle injuries, but certainly here you can see a capitellar shear fracture uh, with significant displacement. And um, probably personally, I would not necessarily have uh, obtained a CT for this particular pattern with these imaging, but she had had a CT by an outside uh, surgeon before referral. So you can clearly see that capitellar shear fracture there. So uh, then I guess for uh, Dr. Sheth, kind of your management of these, you know, uh, surgical likely, but then positioning kind of approach and fixation strategies. Yeah, so these are uh, pretty rare uh, injuries. And of course, like on x-ray, sometimes if you don't see them very well, then you can miss them. And I think it is good that in these cases, always uh, additional imaging will be better, either a CT scan or uh, if it's a very small osteochondral fracture, sometimes you require an MRI. And in this particular case, because the fragment is quite large and displaced, obviously it will be requiring an uh, open reduction and fixation, probably with uh, with small uh, Herbert screws. And uh, uh, probably it will be an anterolateral approach with direct access to the capitulum and fixation with small headless, uh, probably Her Herbert screws. And depending on the stability of the fracture and the reduction, then if it's a good stable fixation, then early mobilization because the chances of again elbow stiffness and uh, 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 problems will be there. So as early as possible, the range of motion can be started if you have a good stable fixation. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. I think those are some really great points, especially on the early motion. So in Atlanta, we have a lot of experience with capitellar OCDs, um, osteochondritis desiccans, and um, osteochondral allografts for the treatment of those. And so we use a cap, uh, an Ankenia split approach, so going posteriorly. And so I thought this case was interesting to use because certainly I saw these fixed um, earlier in training through an anterolateral approach, uh, but this is kind of unique. So um, this position, this patient's placed in a lateral position with the arm over an arm holder. And so the arms, they're lateral on a bean bag. And so the elbows flex about 90 degrees and you can see our skin incision mark there. And so as you get through skin, you come down on ankyneus fascia and we incise ankyneus fascia and then mobilize the ankyneus. Um, and the key with these is to hyperflex the elbow. So as you hyperflex the elbow, you can actually get quite anterior. So this is that same fracture where you see the posterior aspect of the fracture line visualized in this image here. And then you can see the fracture again um, in the image next to it. And so the nice thing about that is through an anterolateral approach, it can be a little bit of a struggle to get screws in the orientation that you need from more anterior to posterior based on this fracture line. But with this approach, uh, you actually get nice fixation. So you, now you can see the trajectory of our wires going more anterior to posterior um, and then drill these. And these are um, headless compression screws that we put in. So you can see kind of drilling across the fragment and then the placement of those screws. And, so now you can kind of nicely see the entire articular surface, those screws placed all anterior to posterior. And then um, I agree kind of for, just to allow a little bit of skin recovery, kind of seven to 10 days in a splint and then getting started with a uh, range of motion right away to minimize elbow stiffness. Okay. So that's a really good approach and very nice result. So if it's a very small fragment, do you use any time suture anchors or what is your approach if it's a very small, uh, uh, like sort of osteochondral fracture where you cannot have a, you know, hold of the screw? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think those are challenging. We see sometimes those with elbow dislocations um, with these kind of shear fractures. We've seen several of those recently. And um, we've used in the knee a suture based technique, um, basically using some anchors with vicral suture and basically making kind of a suture bridge type construct. So you may put, you know, one anchor with vicral through it at the apex and then two down below and then kind of making a suture bridge type construct uh, similar to you would like for a rotator cuff repair that nicely compresses that fragment. You're obviously doing that on a really small scale in the elbow as opposed to the knee, um, but it can work nicely for those kind of chondral only uh, fractures that are significant. Now, if they're smaller pieces, you know, under the size of a centimeter and depending on their location, then you may very reasonably just remove those fragments and let that heal in with marrow stimulation. Any other comments from the rest of the faculty on those fractures? 
I think the hardest thing with this approach is being brave enough to go from the back for a uh, anterior fracture. And uh, like Crystal said, we do these osteochondritis cases. And the thing I always say is that the, the imaging, the CTs and the MRs are usually done with the elbow and extension. So when you look at it, it looks all like it's in the front. But if you take the forearm and rotate it 90 degrees in your mind, you'll be able to get a picture of what Crystal's seeing from the back. And you can get a little bit more than 90 degrees. You think you get 110, 120 degrees, maybe a flexion. And, um, and so I think that's the, uh, I think that was the point we really were, uh, that Crystal was really trying to make on this case is that you, you have to sort of think outside the box to do this a little differently. Maybe kind of rotate the shoulder. And so rather than trying to flex over the arm holder, take the arm out of the arm holder um, and rotate the shoulder and then hyperflex. Um, it's pretty impressive how anterior you can get. So, so Crystal, just a question here. Uh, in case the fracture line is extending far medial into the trochlea, does it work equally well? Because that's that's a larger fragment and you may need to have more screws. So when it's going into across the crista into the trochlear side, does it work equally well? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think you can, you end up limited a little bit as the ulna comes in and the electronons there. Um, I have seen one of these fixed this way that extended into the trochlea, but the trochlear extension was pretty small. So fixation still largely through the capitellum piece was plenty and you could still get a read enough kind of as you follow this along the medial extent, you could still get a read uh, of the okay. most medial extent of that. So would you use an arthrogram to see the quality of your reduction in such cases? Um, I have not used an arthrogram in this setting. You know, arthrograms I typically use when I'm doing a closed reduction. Um, in so for example, a little condyle fracture, I'll use them then if I close reduce it. But once I've opened and I'm kind of looking at my articular read, um, then I typically have not used them in, in those situations. What about you? Uh, I, yeah, I think it's a useful tool even when we open it because you can look far medially with the die, die line rather than having to really expose it. And it's pretty easy. You put in a little die, move the elbow around and you can see the uh, articular alignment far me more medially than actually visually you can see. So I think it's still useful to look into the medial side. So Crystal, one comment and a question. Uh, the comment is uh, make the diagnosis and look for that extra arc on the lateral view because these late are more difficult. But so that's the comment. The question is, how does this heal and why doesn't it? I mean, I haven't had one not heal and I haven't had one dissolve away. And it's this little sliver of cartilage and bone that I always worry isn't going to heal, but most of them seem to do well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we see similar things in the knee with these osteochondral fractures. You know, the ones that I really worry about are these chondral shear fractures that you wonder how these are viable, although we haven't, you know, in our series of chondral only fractures that we've repaired uh, in the knee, we haven't had to go back to revise any of them. You know, I think the majority of these have a significant kind of bony, even though it's a thin bony fragment, some vascularity there. And then I would say the other component is just minimalizing kind of the soft tissue stripping that you do. So I, certainly going posteriorly here, you limit kind of any anterior exposure. Um, and by just mobilizing the ankyneus, you're coming directly down on capsule. And so kind of avoiding kind of all the soft tissue stripping that otherwise might devascularize it. Um, but I agree with you. I think it's probably some of the blood flow of the bone that remains intact to these pieces, but I haven't seen any not heal. So uh, if this patient would have come on day one, like this patient had come after five days, but would, would he have come on day one? Would your approach be different? Like, would you try a close reduction percutaneous spinning along with arthrogram or would it always be a, an open reduction? Um, I think in my hands, these are open reduction and fixation. My concern is, is that pinning these, A, to get the pins, you know, the orientation you need, I think it's really hard to get closed. And then as you mentioned, early range of motion with these intraarticular fractures, I think is certainly important. And so uh, in the setting of a pinning, I would be concerned, A, I don't have, although I think they would heal pretty reliably with that. I think if you're gonna treat it like a lateral condyle and go four or five weeks potentially um, prior to pulling pins, I would worry significantly about stiffness of the elbow. So in my hands, I would open and uh, get um, absolute stability in these. Have you had any experience with a closed reduction in pinning of them? 
time, you know, it, it is a missed fracture. It's like a trash lesion and it gets missed on day one. So we have, most of the time, it's a delayed presentation and uh, it's always better to do a, it's an articular fracture. So we need a perfect anatomical reduction. It's always better to do it open and fix the screws. It's loose. I agree. So that's a great approach and a nice result. But would you always counsel the parents about uh, the possible stiffness and uh, what will be your counseling when you approach these uh, children? Yeah, I think any intra-articular fracture, regardless of the joint you're working on, I talk to them a lot about stiffness and um, you know, I think spending a fair amount of you know, counseling and talking about it ahead of time is helpful. Although obviously I think for the family, their focus and stress at that moment is getting through surgery. And, but I think spending a lot of early time with them, um, especially I think talking directly to the kids and helping them understand that you know, you're gonna feel things, what you think is ripping, tearing, pulling, popping, um, but that it's perfectly safe and okay. And so I spend a little time in clinic working with range of motion so they can kind of start to feel what is that feeling um, rather than getting to the point of discomfort and stopping pushing past that and talk a lot, you know, it's one thing when you have a, you know, 15 or 16 year old, that's pretty diligent, but in a seven, eight, nine, 10 year old, uh, this really requires good family oversight and making sure that they all have bought into this. But yeah, I think certainly laying a lot of crepe, um, but I think uh, just making sure that they understand what it, it, it would takes and involves to get good motion is important. All right, Crystal, thank you. See if I got the right thing. You seeing the screen? There we go. All right. Yes, Doctor Gupta, you're no, you're up yeah. with me again. Yeah. All right. So here we have a uh, seven-year-old male weighs about forty-two kilos. You can see a pretty good soft tissue envelope. Uh, it's a closed injury. Uh, he's in a motor vehicle accident and uh, closed injury of the uh, of the femur. He has uh, no other significant injuries. Um, so by definition, this is one of your everyday injuries, right? Femur fractures, about 1.5% of all children's fractures, um, but not all of them are so easy. So I think typical options are spica or IF with the plates, flex rods, external fixators, submuscular plate, and rigid locking nails. So um, taking a look at this case, Dr. Gupta, anything yeah. particularly concern you? Yeah. And uh, can you tell us about uh, what you might think of in terms yeah. of rank ordering these choices? Uh, see, this is a fracture which is in the proximal third and uh, just uh, uh, part of it looks like in the subtrochantric area. It's an oblique fracture, so potentially unstable fracture. So for me, and uh, the third thing is that the child is uh, around 42 kg, a pretty heavy child. So for me, spica is out of question in a seven-year-old child. It would be the first preference would be a submuscular plate. And second would be the flex rods. But again, you know, a lot of decision would be taken on table. If you have a good, I mean, this from this, the fracture and not means not too clear to me, especially the lateral view. Because EP view, there is a lot of overlap. So I would keep both the options on table including the submuscular plate and the flex rods. Okay. So these would be, but the first preference still would be a submuscular plate, or not a nail, not a rigid nail, not a rigid nail. Sure. All right, I think I would go with that. So I'm gonna ask you questions then about submuscular plating. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you do it. Do you do it on a regular table, a yeah. jacks table, a fractured table? Do you use a tourniquet? Uh, how do you, how do you uh, uh, size of your incision. Tell us a little bit about how you do it. Give us some tips. So I'll do it on a fracture table. I don't use a tourniquet because uh, that will come in the way. Uh, size of the insertion and incision would be as per the comfort level, but I would actually get about uh, uh, about three to four, cent four centimeters or so. And uh, it would be in a, in a heavy child, I would go in for a little mini open at the far end screws. Uh, 
not not percutaneous but in a in a thinner child i could where you can easily palpate the plate subcutaneously from the skin i would uh, try and do it percutaneous but uh, under image guidance as well but in a heavy child i would uh, err on this side side of uh, incision mm. okay yeah what about the sagittal plane i think that's always one of the real challenges yes in managing these kids so, yes so that again you do by uh, close reduction and uh, i mean i'm not particularly able to understand uh, the sagittal plane thing uh, what exactly trips to managing the sagittal plane you know you can uh, i mean most of the times the traction and uh, does the trick for me so i don't have much issues with that all right yeah so timing of removal would be about 3 yep. uh, to 4 months 3 uh, to 6 months after the full union i would each for a locked uh, rigid nail i would go with the 12 plus 12 years and more so you ever use uh, a locking nail in skeletally immature patients uh, if uh, yeah, 12 if years a 13, plus 14 year old boy who is immature does that worry you to do a lock nail or do you I've figure never, that- yeah it's uh, for me it's around 12 years and above 12 years and above yeah not not in uh-huh. a younger child all right good well so um Uh, actually, I'm happy you chose so some muscular plate because uh, I chose the opposite um, to just show you sort of my technique of doing this. So here, as you can see, this is a very comminuted fracture. That's what I was trying to get you to talk about, and you, of course, picked up on it. And uh, some people will call these linked unstable. So I did this with instead of I did these with uh, flexible retrograde stainless steel nails. And uh, here you can see the patient at three weeks. You can see that the uh, The rods are all sticking out just uh, below the level of the physis, and uh, we've got uh, good control and good filling of the canal. Here's the uh, choice. Uh, I assume similar to what you would have done. Any comments about uh, about this is a different fracture, obviously, but similar. Yeah. Any comments about how it's done and um, how you would approach it? Uh, you mean the incision? The incision? No, no, no. Just let. Lateral or posterior lateral for me. Usually, I'll go with a posterior lateral, and uh, I mean, a lot of times uh, I would tend to do it with a fixator assistance as well, with one pin at the top and one pin at the bottom, and that will go in with a little ligamento taxis. You can align the fragments better, and that will give you a better control. And once you put the plate in, you remove the top and the bottom pin. Right. All right. And then uh, I know you said you remove them early. I know that some of my partners have had. Uh, I've done a few of these, not as many, uh, but uh, you can really get overgrowth right very quickly of the periosteum, right? Yeah. Okay. That's usually oh. not troublesome. Now my question is: in the previous case, did you use external immobilization, or it, or was it stable enough? No, I didn't. Uh, Yeah, I, I certainly can, and I always talk to the residents about that. That I don't consider that a defeat. Um, I prefer to get it to the rigid enough that uh, you don't need to have a cast as well, though. And one more question, Michael, is that yeah. in case you felt that at the end of your procedure of multiple uh, intramedullary pins, you are not able to achieve a good stability, would you have done something alternative, or uh, would you have sort of added a Another fixation device like like a X fix, or would you have added a spica in case you felt that even after putting four rods? Sure, I think you'd always need to have sort of a backup plan. Um, I, I haven't gotten myself into that jam yet, but uh, but yes, I think having that as a backup plan is a good one. So, what was what would be your backup plan in such like cases? Would you keep a plate ready on table, or would you keep sure. X fix ready on table, or would you rely on a spica? Um, it would depend, but uh, I, I would mo- think I'd most likely be able to add a spica uh, unless it was really unstable. And then I'd then I'd wonder about whether I'd made the right choice at all, and maybe maybe uh, switch to a submuscular plate. That because you know we we talk about the submuscular plate as being a an internal external fixator, right? So um, um, we need to be uh, you know I, I think it sort of works on uh, similar kind of principles.
Let me show you a little bit more about this. So a rigid nail, maybe for a larger person, uh, here's a, a 16 year old with a, a similar kind of fracture, a very comminuted fracture. But again, I, I'm really leery about using um, the lock nails uh, while they're skeletally immature. So that's part of the reason that uh, I like this uh, four rod technique. Um, I can put them into, uh, um, into larger patients. Here's a classic indication, sort of a transverse stable fracture for using two uh, metazo kind of uh, nails. Um, we, uh, we published an article in JPO just uh, two years ago on this uh, technique of using four rods. Um, I always say the entrance uh, site for me is what I call between the flap and the flare. So it's fairly high up. And I do use, typically use a sterile tourniquet above here because I'm making a distal approach. It helps me, uh, it helps me get uh, good visualization. I make my drill holes. Often there's two drill holes. And the key thing is getting the drill very oblique and then uh, uh, using one of these uh, um, balls to uh, get this thing as uh, oblique as I can. And then uh, start with my uh, two uh, nails uh, first and uh, get them flat against here, get my fracture reduced, and uh, maybe it's still a little bit unstable. And then what I do is I take one of the rods and I will gently pull it out to get enough gap in here that I can insert the next nail through the same opening. You got to make sure you don't elastic, you don't plastically deform this because I want this thing sticking way out in the leg. Uh, but you can still do that. You can get it out enough and get this rod to slip inside here, and then ultimately I get my uh, my fourth nail in place. I think a lot of people use sort of the general rule of 80% of the width of the canal. So if you have a 10 millimeter canal, you would use two fours, so a total of eight. And when I guess uh, people go, how can you get more rods in there? So certainly if it was this space, you would say there's no room, but you forget that this is a three-dimensional structure. And so with two rods, you get about a 32% fill. With uh, four rods, you can get anywhere, you can get up to a 64% fill if I went to four rods. This is my typical construct. If I were, if for instance, it was big enough for four millimeter rods, then my next two would be uh, 3.5s. And so I get a, uh, a much uh, larger fill of the canal. We looked at uh, 12 cases, you can see, Fairly good sized patients. Five of them were greater than 50 kilos. They all united. None of them had additional surgeries uh, other than routine uh, removal of hardware. No limb like discrepancies, no malalignments. And I didn't have any of those cases that you were asking about where I had to uh, add uh, anything else to stabilize it. Here's a couple Here. of other quick examples. Here's a, a nine year old, two three fives and, and two three O's. Uh, so it took this very long oblique fracture and uh, stabilized it. Here's another common indication, you know, as you get down to the flare distally, now you gotta be careful, you can't be too distal, you go into the entry sites, but you get into this flare where the canal is much wider than it is up here, and you can get four nails, they don't necessarily have to all go the full length of the, um, of the canal, and this went on to heal. Here's another good indication, this was a 11 year old boy who uh, had a, a long fall at an open fracture. This was the entire medial cortex. So after putting the rods in, you can see the, the medial defect that, uh, that I was left with. Uh, but again, with the four rods, I thought that was very stable. He was doing fine until three months out, he fell at the swimming pool and he cracked through the top of the callus. And we just watched him. We just put him on crutches for a short time, did not reoperate. And look at how he filled in that medial uh, cortex completely there. And um, here he is five months, seven months, we took the hardware out. He uh, had completely reconstituted that medial cortex, you know, the beauties of kids, right? With an intact uh, periosteum. If you're worried about him backing out, this is Ender's rods, not the, uh, not the uh, orthopediatrics rods, but you can add some screws to them. And um, um, those, are my, uh, those are my tricks. Yeah, uh, can I ask you one more question? Sure, of course. Uh, do you do you do you uh, keep the all the rods of the same size, or do you put different size rods, or do you pair them? Yeah, so I typically put in a pair of what I think are going to be the larger size. So I might put in two 4.0 millimeter uh, rods, one from medial, one from lateral, and then my next pair of rods, one from medial, one from lateral, will be typically like a three five. So I go down a half millimeter. Because uh, again, I'm not worried about the strength now. I'm trying to, what's called stacking the canal. This is back from, if you read Ender's, uh, yeah, I have a, like a, Ender's. a copy of Ender's book, right? And he has this thing called stacking the canal. The idea is to push the rods out 
against the cortex. And that's what really gives it torsional stability as well as bending stability. And do you remove them and when do you remove them? Yes, I always, uh, uh, I always remove them uh, virtually always uh, because the kids are going to grow. And as you do, the metaphysis grows away from the diaphysis where the rods are located. And um, I, I take them out usually six to nine months. So not, you don't have to do it as quickly as you do the submuscular plates, but I do like to get them out. And I stainless steel, by the way, I didn't talk about that, but uh, I always use stainless steel. I, I, I don't know quite why we came, became so infatuated with titanium. <clears throat> stainless steel is particularly stronger in torsion. And uh, one of the big problems with these uh, is inserting them and turning the rods to go and get across the fracture site. And if you use titanium, there, I, I've had them, I've had trouble passing once in a while a titanium one, you pull it all the way out and you got like a, a, a helix. And um, so that's the reason I've, I've stuck to stainless steel. I don't really see the advantage of uh, titanium for this. Do you encounter any difficulty while removing the nail anytime because there are four rods and sometimes, you know, they are quite close to each other. Any difficulty or anything different than when we have just two rods? I haven't. And that's, uh, again, I think one of the important points is making that, uh, that entrance site high so that there's plenty of rods sticking out and then uh, orthopediatrics makes a nice rod remover. It's a, a nice solid clamp and I've been able to elevate it up, get that clamp on there and then slap hammer it out. But um, uh, don't wait too long. You always put four rods or you have uh, some type no, no. of yeah. three? No, my average, yeah, my average case is two, but for length unstable uh, ones, ones that are very proximal, ones that are distal, that you're trying to sort of extend the, the ideal place for using flex rods. And I have no problem with using submuscular plates. I certainly do. Uh, I'm not trying to say that you do every one, uh, but if you have a heavier kid or, or a more challenging fracture, I think that four rods is a, a good way to get yourself out of the trouble. I'll tell you what I'm going to wind up. I don't want to get uh, take Steve's time. Steve? Yeah, great cases. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mike, just a question about uh, before uh, we move on to the next case. Uh, you asked a question about the sagittal plane. How do you manage the sagittal plane in the submuscular plane? So what is your answer to that? Yeah. How do I manage which part? Sagittal plane uh, deformity. Sagittal plane alignment in the submuscular plate. Oh, yeah. To me, that's challenging. That's one of the reasons I asked the question is that, is that, uh, uh, is that it's really tough to get the sagittal plane in alignment. So using those little pinholes uh, through some of the uh, plates now, I think are very helpful. Uh, but I think it's challenging. I've had to almost open the other, the, the distal part of the fracture in order to get them in alignment. So um, I think it's very challenging. Okay, yeah. Freaks, please. Can you guys see my slides? Yes. Great. All right, so femoral neck fractures, we... Uh, we're going to talk about them mainly because um, they're not that common, but complications after femoral neck fractures are common. So here's a 16-year-old displaced femoral neck fracture, um, closed reduction and screw fixation. And I think left in varus, and thus when you're in varus, you can't get the screws in the right position. And you see over time it drifts, falls into more varus, and eventually needs to get revised. So... The goal when we treat these is not to do that, is to avoid complications. And those complications, AVN, malunion, non-union, um, and AVN and malunion being the most common. Um, and I think getting a great reduction leads to better fixation. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about where to put your implants. So for the surgeons, you can't control that the patient had this injury, but you can control some things that might uh, affect the outcome. When do you do the case? Controversial. For me, I do it in the light of day when I have a good team, um, usually within 24 hours. Um, what operative approach you use? Do you need to decompress any potential capsular hematoma? I always decompress the capsular hematoma um, potentially. Um, and then I think really pay attention to your reduction and put good implants in, which we'll talk about. If you don't have an extra set of hands and you have a really big patient like this one, then I think you need a fracture table. Um, I happen to practice in a place where I often have a resident or a fellow helping me. So I have an extra set of hands, um, but think about that. Um, I like to call it an emergency action plan. So what am I going to do if my plan A doesn't work, um, have a plan B, a plan C, 
And the list on the right for me is really what I want to talk about for femoral neck fractures. You need good light, um, either a headlamp or a lighted suction tip because the hole can get very deep and very dark. Um, special hip retractors can help you see. Um, I'll show you the half pins and reduction clamps that I use, and then you need to fix it um, stably and with a good construct. So here's a typical uh, type two uh, mid cervical fracture displaced. Um, for these, I like a Smith-Peterson approach and then a separate lateral incision for the screws. Um, I think the reduction really matters. You should be very critical of your reduction. Um, and I'll tell you, I like to see it with my own eyes and look at it with fluoro. But on fluoro, you want to do this. You want to look at the four S's and they should be smooth uh, on the inferior and superior neck and on the anterior and posterior neck um, to make sure you have a nice reduction. My reduction tips are these four things. So I open the capsule. I tend to, for displaced fractures, I always do an open reduction. I put sutures in the capsule so I can lift it up and pull it apart and look right down onto the neck. I typically put a blunt retractor, like you see this blunt home in here, inside the capsule on the medial side to see the medial fracture. And I put two half pins in. I put one in the head neck fragment and one in the trochanter fragment so that then I have control and I can rotate it around and get it anatomically reduced. Um, so here's an 11 year old with a type two fracture displaced Smith-Peterson approach, one half pin in the head neck piece, one half pin in the greater trochanter piece. You can see we can get a nice fluoroscopic reduction, uh, but I really even don't trust that. And I like to look right at it. So this happened to be a skinny patient. So it's easy for me to show you a good picture but here's a lighted sucker tip. You can see the fracture here in the middle. And if I blow it up for you, you can see like it is interdigitating and anatomically reduced. And that's really what I'm trying to do. Sometimes you'll have some comminution that makes it more challenging, but I want a perfect anatomic reduction if I can get one. Then I'm gonna fix it with screws um, for a type two fracture. And I tend to put um, two proximally, sort of an inverted triangle and one uh, along the inferior neck I tend to put a lag screw in first because varus is your enemy. And I try to squeeze the lateral side first and then put uh, either one more lag screw or, and often on the bottom, I'll put a fully threaded screw. Uh, but I want an anatomic reduction. And here at three months looks healed. And we follow them, of course, for AVN. For fractures that are a little more distal, either type threes at the base of the neck or a type four, I actually use a Watson Jones. And I usually do that so I can put this one extra clamp in because I think this helps me reduce the fracture and keep it out of varus. So here's a 13 year old type three fracture displaced happened three days ago. Um, here's a Watson Jones approach. Again, I'm going to see the fracture. Here's a, my lighted sucker tip. Again, a relatively skinny patient. But when you're doing a Watson Jones, I've got my retractor in the medial capsule, um, but I can put this clamp on, which you'll see in the next picture which I really think helps me. Um, again, here it is not reduced. I can use these two chance pins to rotate it and get it perfectly reduced. Uh, but putting this clamp on right here, I think for these type three and four fractures really helps me squeeze the neck superiorly here. Again, we're trying to prevent that varus tilt that I think goes on to failure often in malunion. So get a perfect reduction and then fix it stably. And this one, I happen to use a construct that has a small little side plate, which I usually do for the type threes and fours. Type twos, I use three screws. Type four, threes and fours, I usually use a little side plate. Here that is with the final fixation healed at three months. And so Dr. Sheff, I, I'm interested, uh, what are your approaches? Do you use closed reduction? And how do you approach it if you're going to open it? Yeah, so as you rightly said, uh, these are uh, uncommon fractures, but with a lot of complications, mainly being avascular necrosis and non-union. So yes, we also do it at the earliest, not in the middle of the night, but first thing in the next available OT on the next day. So that's as early as possible. Another thing is uh, I prefer doing them as far as possible on fracture table because that gives me a good uh, AP and lateral fluoroscopic view of the reduction uh, as if the child is big enough to be kept on a fracture table. Getting an anatomical reduction should always be uh, the criteria, as you rightly said, and look for those two S. Uh, uh, crossing the physis is not an issue, but stability is 
is a must. So should not be scared to cross the physis because as we know that growth potential and growth from the proximal femoral physis is not so much. So stability is more important than uh, because we see a lot of patients who a uh, uh, lot of surgeons sometimes are scared of crossing the physis, especially if you have type one, type two. To get a stable uh, fixation, you need to cross the physis. So I I'm not, don't hesitate to cross the physis. And uh, in the first case, which you showed that 16 year old probably it failed because it was a too less of a fixation that would have uh, been uh, better with a side plate, uh, uh, a big child with uh, uh, even if it's a trans cervical or type two delbit, you can put in a plate so that the, the fixation is good. So getting an anatomical reduction is one and getting a stable fixation is the second thing. Another thing, I always try and decompress the hematoma. So that will lead to uh, decreasing the tamponade and at least uh, you know, prevent to some extent uh, the avascular necrosis. Of course, we know it's the initial injury or the type of fracture which is going to decide. But to decrease the tamponade, I do a subadductor approach and decompress the hematoma if I'm going to go for a close reduction and fixation. So I think these are some of the tips about uh, you know uh, do it as early as possible get a an, get an anatomical reduction if required cross the physis but get a stable reduction and uh, I think that should be the ways to prevent uh, the main complications of non-union and avascular necrosis. I agree; those are excellent points. And uh, as you see here, all the screws going across the physis, and there are actually a couple of case reports not only of loss of fixation, but uh, if you stop right at the physis, there've been a couple of unstable slips at the edge of the um, screws through the yeah. physis. So um, I, I agree, stability over uh, preserving the physis. Um, and in addition, if you feel that, you know, it's still, you know, in a smaller child, sometimes we supplement with a spica or put them in a splint for a few initial days so that, you know, the stability is improved to a certain extent, you know addition to uh, fixation, in, especially in smaller children, adding a spica for the initial days till it starts uniting, that will give an added stability to the fracture fixation. Yeah, I agree. And these older patients who can cooperate, I usually put them on touchdown weight bearing one sixth of their body weight. But uh, in younger kids, I, I will, who I think are not going to be compliant with weight bearing restrictions, I typically put them in a single leg spica and flex their hip and their knee a little bit really to add stability, but enforce um, protected weight bearing, usually for about four weeks. Um, it, if you do a close reduction, um, have you done anything to try to assess uh, the perfusion of the femoral head? Um, and, uh, you know, I know that out of Atlanta, uh, Tim Schrader has a really interesting case series of unstable slips where he has placed an intracranial pressure monitor up through the cannulated screw. Uh, have you had any experience with that? Personally, I don't do, but I think some centers, uh, they, they have been doing that. But at my center, I don't do. I just do, a, as I said, a decompression by putting a wide board needle in subadductor approach and decompress the hematoma in order to reduce the tamponade effect. But yeah, I his don't series do was really anymore. interesting that he had documented no waveform. Um, and I think it's more important for me not so much to do the monitoring, but to do the decompression. And what he did was he showed that uh, he had no waveform and unstable slips until he slid a small cob elevator up the capsule to the middle of the neck and knew kind of felt that he was on bone. And after he did that decompression, he had the waveform return in all six of those patients and they did not get AVN. So I think decompression should be, if you, I, I always, I like to see it. So I prefer to do an open reduction, but if you don't do an open reduction and you think you have a good close reduction, then I would recommend decompression and, and very good fixation. Steve, can I ask you, what is your approach to open reduction? All cases you go with Watson-Jones or with uh, Smith-Peterson or something else? Yeah, so for me, um, it, it really depends on, I want to be able to see the fracture well. And so, uh, and especially in a really heavy overweight patient, if you have a type two a proximal fracture, um, the Watson Jones can just more soft tissue to get out of the way to see the fracture. So I tend to do a Smith Peterson approach for mid cervical fractures. And I, I tend to do uh, a Watson Jones for the base of the neck or the intertrochanteric fractures. Uh, 
have to ask you any role of uh, conservative treatment in uh, say very undisplaced type 4 delbet in very small children or do you think that all hip yeah, fracture i i think if you had that would be unusual and, and most likely you know my experience has been with those really young children that they actually are typically the victims of uh, you know multi trauma blunt trauma run over by a car or something like that and in that situation i'm i'm also less uh, likely to put a spike cast on and try to cover things up. So I, um, so I'm, but I think that if you had a isolated injury and a non-displaced fracture, that uh, non-operative care with spike cast would be appropriate. And, uh, Thank you, Steve. Off. That's great. Can uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Sheth. Could, do you mind if we move along? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, we got uh, Crystal and Dr. Gupta next. Okay, excellent. So um, as much as we all enjoy fixing elbow fractures and femur fractures, uh, I tend to carry the black cloud at our hospital. And so this was just a usual Friday afternoon starting call where we take call of Friday to Friday. And so it started with a code green, which is a mass casualty event, which was a big apartment fire where seven children jumped out of a third story apartment building. Um, so we got a whole array of things, but uh, one of the things was this case. And so it's a good example of kids get adult fractures too and some uh, basic trauma principles. So this is a 15 year old male who jumped out of a second story window of the apartment fire. He had isolated closed bilateral ankle injuries. And so you can see these are just his x-rays from the trauma bay um, of his left ankle. Uh, where you see a partial articular or what appears to be a partial articular inter, uh, distal tibia fracture. And then on the right, uh, what looks to be more of a complex injury with a um, distal fibula fracture as well as a complete articular distal tibia fracture. And so in this setting uh, for Dr. Gupta, you have bilateral interarticular distal tibia fractures. These are about eight, these are pictures of his ankles uh, just about six hours after the injury. So um, do you proceed with advanced imaging initially? Would you get advanced imaging of both of them, one or the other? And then talk a little bit about your timing, you know, single stage, uh, meaning kind of management in a splint or external fixator um, addressing one side or the other. Usually these are injuries which cause a lot of edema and swelling. So my preference would be initially span the ankle with the X-fix. And at that point of time, I'll go into the advanced imaging. And that will help you. These are almost, these are like adult fractures. So these are not like a children fractures. So I would span the ankle, go in with the uh, CT imaging to plan my placement of the heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, the mistake sometimes people will make is they'll jump to get a CT to look at it right away. And I, I agree with you completely. I think if a fracture is not out to length and you're likely treating this in a staged fashion with an X-fix, then you'll find your imaging is much more helpful for you to get once you're in an X-fix and out to length. Um, so this patient on his... Uh, let's see my next slide. So this is his left ankle. This was a partial articular fracture um, and his skin didn't look awful when he came in. And my initial thought was I would consider fixing the left ankle acutely. And so we went ahead and got a CT on this side and um, you know, certainly pilon fractures or intraarticular distal tibia fractures have very classic uh, for articular fragments with them. So here you can see this anterolateral fracture, which was uh, displaced. And then you see a more minimally displaced fracture extending anterior medial. Um, and so for uh, this patient, he went to the OR the next morning and we put an X fix on his right side. Again, that was the one that's already blistering. That's a complete articular fracture. And so got him out into some reasonable length and splinted his right side. But given that his skin looked good, we went ahead and fixed his left side. So kind of pearls for this is an anterior lateral approach. So this, just like many intraarticular fractures, you wanna be very thoughtful about your soft tissue handling. So kind of minimal touch approach here with well-positioned uh, retractors. So we could see directly the anterior lateral fragment and we're able to get that reduced and then provisionally pinned with a K wire. And then ultimately, once we had our provisional fixation, we were able to get definitive fixation with this anterolateral distal tibial plate. And these kind of have variable angle distal screws so that you can get purchased more into that more non-displaced uh, medial fragment. 
I think for this particular ankle, it was really helpful doing this one acutely as long as the skin was uh, good because it was much easier to mobilize these fragments. Anything that you'd consider doing differently on this side? I think if the skin is good, then you can go ahead. I'll agree to that. But uh, this is like a fracture which in my institute, most of the times my adult uh, uh, colleagues will uh, take care because this is <laughs> after skeletal maturity. So I usually will not treat it. Uh, I used to treat it earlier, but now I don't do it. Mm -hmm. So then but the right angle, so now that strategy he's in is Strategy is same, yes. Uh, yeah. Sure, yeah, you mentioned getting a CT now at this point. Yeah. Um, so here's his CT and I've just included some representative images, certainly a much more complex fracture than his contralateral side was. You see kind of anterior lateral, posterior lateral, anterior medial fragments, and then his uh, distal fibula fracture as well. So when you manage these in an external fixator initially, whether this is, you know, the pediatric tibial plateau, which we see sometimes, or the distal tibia fracture, any pearls for kind of decreasing soft tissue swelling, managing soft tissues, and then timing to definitive fixation? Yeah, after the wrinkle sign appears. After you know, you if you operate, uh, the swelling is uh, subsided enough so that you put your hardware in, you're able to close this skin. Mm -hmm. So after the yeah, wrinkling that... appears, yes, that is the point of time when we usually choose to fix them internally. And that's usually around four or five days, six days down the line, four or five days. Up. So mm -hmm. even after X fix. Sure. Yeah, I think the sooner you can get to them, the easier, right? It's much easier to mobilize the fragments um, while also being kind of thoughtful about the soft tissues. Right. So this child, um, given his social situation, apartment fire, stayed in the hospital. And so we had him on kind of strict elevation um, on multiple pillows. You can also use kind of a pulley system above the bed that works well for uh, ankles as well to kind of decrease soft tissue swelling as quickly as you can. We knew we were going to make both anterior and lateral approaches, so really wanted to be sure. And Unfortunately, his soft tissues took quite some time. So eventually uh, we treated this. He was about three and a half weeks before his soft tissues were amenable to fixation. So kind of key pearls uh, treating these articular fractures. So one, of course, maximizing the skin bridge and an otherwise healthy teenager were a little less concerned than your diabetic smoker, uh, but still being very thoughtful in these areas about planning your skin incisions. Um, I think just similar to plateaus and for pylons as well, maintaining your external fixator is helpful to maintain some traction. So we took his tibial pins out, but maintaining the calc pin helps you control a little bit of varus and valgus and uh, traction, um, kind of meticulous soft tissue handling and full thickness flaps, as we talked about before. And then your fibula is your friend here. And you know, I initially did give some consideration of fixing his fibula acutely on the side, but due to his massive soft tissue swelling, just didn't feel like it was amenable to that, but it certainly helps you restore length. And then building your articular blocks back, kind of basic AO trauma principles, talking about, you know, your PITFL helps keep that posterior lateral fragment reduced. And so then building our block back to that, which is what we did for him. And then and this is, uh, these are his x-rays bilateral at three and a half months uh, post-op where uh, still a little bit of healing left to do on his uh, more complex side. What's your typical post-op protocol in terms of weight bearing uh, for these intraarticular fractures? See, our protocol here is that after the fracture unites, only then we allow full weight bearing. So uh, you... prior to that, it all depends on the stability, but usually will not allow weight bearing till the fracture unites fully. Mm -hmm. yeah, so Even touchdown weight bearing, we can allow uh, touchdown weight bearing. Mm -hmm. but as the yeah, fracture unites, it's not a time frame, but as the fracture, if you see radio, radiographic evidence of healing, then you gradually increase the weight bearing. Mm -hmm. So what is your protocol there? Sure. So his fractures were staged about three and a half weeks apart with his partial articular injury on his contralateral side. Um, I let him, it's hard because he was completely non weight bearing because he couldn't really transfer on either side. So we started letting him transfer on the left side at eight weeks and was full weight bearing on the left side at 12 weeks. And then uh, was 12 weeks non weight bearing on the right side and then progressed his weight bearing on the right side. What a, talk a little bit about uh, vitamin D has certainly gained a lot of attention here in the U.S. with 
fractures and other orthopedic manifestations. Uh, do you do any routine vitamin D supplementation, multivitamin supplementation in the setting of uh, fracture healing? Not really, not really. But to be honest with you, if you get vitamin D levels of uh, 10 people, nine will turn out to be deficient. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do not do get it done in all, any patient of fracture, unless we are suspecting some like uh, vitamin D deficient or stomatitis or vitamin D deficiency, like rickets, but not in a routine patient. Do you yeah, do you it routinely? And uh, do you supplement them with vitamin D routinely? Um, for many fractures I have for this kid, I did. Um, I put him on 5,000 international units of vitamin D a day plus a multivitamin. And I mean, you can see in his images here how diffusely osteopenic he is at, you know, after 12 weeks of non-weight bearing it all on uh, both sides. So um, I think for extenuating circumstances, I do for the routine, you know, both bone forearm fracture, I have not been, but I think uh, that's certainly gaining more and more attention. So do you, do you get the vitamin D levels done and then supplement or do you do it in all the patients? Um, we, for some problems, we do get routine vitamin D levels. So all of our Skiffy patients get routine uh, vitamin D levels. Our OCD patients get routine vitamin D levels um, just because we know that that's likely an implicating cause in many of those conditions. Uh, oftentimes for fractures, when I'm using it, I do not routinely check vitamin D levels unless it's a child with kind of atypical multiple fractures that I'm looking up another source. Um, but typically my usual is 2000 international units of vitamin D a day. Um, and then in some exceptions, again, different fracture patterns are really low levels, 5,000. You can also do weekly dosing. Um, I know Mike Bush does that a fair amount, uh, just to make it a little bit easier with dosing and, uh, less worry about daily compliance. Till what time do you supplement vitamin D? Uh, typically for OCDs and Skiffy patients, I actually keep them on it uh, until skeletal maturity. Um, and so we've continued to do that, certainly to OCD healing. Um, but I think if they get pretty good at doing it, then it's reasonable to continue. You can't really overdose on vitamin D. Um, and so I've typically just continued it with their multivitamin. So for fracture cases, like. I think traumatic fracture, traumatic fracture. fracture. Yeah, I think once they're healed and then just encouraging a multivitamin. Yeah, I would say that uh, I've been getting them on the tibial tuberosity fractures, the tibial spine fractures, and the fifth metatarsal fractures. And, um, you know, like you said, it's, it's hard to know whether it's a contributing factor or not when so many kids are low, but that doesn't mean it's not a contributing factor. So um, I figure as inexpensive and low risk as vitamin D is that it's, uh, it's worth doing. So you do the same with calcium also, you supplement in addition calcium when this is patients of fracture or only vitamin D? Mm -hmm. I've typically just used a multivitamin plus a vitamin D supplement. So I have not supplemented uh, calcium as well. I think some of the families will ask me, you know, can I use Citracal or stuff like that, that has a calcium supplement. And I think that's certainly fine. So Crystal, uh, what I want to add is that a lot of these patients, uh, they get, do get a disuse uh, atrophy, uh, distro, I mean, atrophy of the bone or osteopenia of the bone. So do you feel uh, that, uh, the vitamin D, is there some evidence I'm not aware of that vitamin D will take care of that or is it like with progressive weight bearing? Because what my understanding is that with progressive weight bearing, this will correct by itself. So does no, vitamin I think that's, Yeah. I agree with you. I think that's certainly important. Um, we actually started this kid in some aqua therapy just to be able to start putting some limited weight bearing pressure down on his legs just to it advance his weight bearing and to improve some of this, this use osteopenia. So I'll have some follow-up x-rays on that soon. But I think the majority of it is, you know, we know from looking at the elderly and osteoporosis literature, getting some weight bearing exercise and this normalizes and returns. Um, mm. I certainly, we don't have the studies to show, you know, does that accelerate at all in the setting of vitamin D, but um, certainly can't imagine that it's of any harm. And we see the significant improvements in ossification with other various um, kind of orthopedic manifestations. So I've used it for this indication as well. All right, Crystal, thank you very much. Great case. Cases. Great.
Okay, so um, another uh, case, Dr. Sheth, uh, I'm gonna be working with you on this one. So I have a 15 year old competitive swimmer, highly competitive swimmer. She's uh, likely to swim uh, uh, on a scholarship program in college is the expectation. She's right-hand dominant. Um, she uh, uh, she uh, fell and sustained this uh, displaced mid-shaft left clavicle fracture. Um, she has a lot of pain. And this is even, I saw her maybe two days after injury and uh, was still having a great deal of uh, discomfort and uh, a prominence back in her trapezius. So these, of course, are common injuries, 10 to 15% of all pediatric fractures. <clears throat> about 90% of them are mid-shaft. And that's what we're really going to be talking about, the mid-shaft ones. So uh, maybe you can talk to us and uh, answer some of these questions. Do you ever operate on them? What are your indications and uh, how often? Yeah, so we know that clavicle, as you said, is a very common fracture, mostly in the middle third. And uh, they do have very good healing potential because the medial clavicular physis uh, fuses very late. So there's a lot of remodeling. But uh, the indication to operate will depend upon uh, the amount, I mean, the type of fracture. For example, if this person is a professional swimmer and it's almost like widely displaced and tenting on the skin, almost like trying to come out and significantly displace then to get early rehabilitation and early get getting to go early, I would probably in this case, because of the patient uh, profile, I would operate and uh, put in a plate and screw. But otherwise you can very well conserve uh, middle third tibia. My indications where I would operate is if it's a segmental fracture or if it's like a floating shoulder where you have a clavicle with uh, some proximal humerus fracture, or if there is any neurovascular complications, or if it's like a polytrauma or significant overriding, maybe more than two or three centimeters, then maybe it's an indication, but otherwise majority. And, and again, it's like a little older child. If it's a young child with these overlapping, we know that there's a lot of remodeling and even angular correction. And you know there's no, there's lengthening also. So a lot of remodeling in clavicle. So the indications for surgery for me will be really limited. And uh, uh, non-unions, uh, not very common. Uh, if they have some underlying uh, problems or if, uh, uh, if there is some soft tissue interposition, some tenting of the uh, muscle interposition or anything, then otherwise non-unions, not, uh, not very common. All right. Um, one of the things I've always wondered about the non-unions are whether there's some sort of a mild form or some underlying costs like the uh, like the congenital pseudarthrosis. Have you ever heard anything like that? Do you ever ever have those thoughts? Yeah, Sometimes we have. Yeah, I mean, some, just, some, just don't heal. Yeah, that, that's what I said. Some underlying pseudoarthrosis or something. Occasionally, of course, you see them more in tibia, but some uh, neurofibromatosis, some underlying condition. Okay. What about uh, do you uh, measure them? Do you do you consider that an important thing? Do you look at how much shortening there is? And if so, what uh, what do you do with that information, or how often so how often do you operate said, for just shortening? Uh, if it's more than two centimeter, two to three centimeter of shortening, uh, again, I think there are two different. Some people measure end to end, some people measure cortex to cortex. So I think the measurements are going to differ. If you measure end to end, it will be more, but actually, it should be cortex to cortex. It's quite uh, limited, so uh, probably that way uh, we measure. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I'll show you a little bit about uh, uh, just exactly what you were talking about. I've got some great illustrations of that. Um, what about uh, disability? Do you, do you perceive, do you see many kids that have been not treated uh, that are shortened and have problems? Do you, do you ever see nerve entrapment? Do you see much trouble with refracture? How about complications from, from treatment of clavicle fractures? Shortening maybe initially, immediately after the union you may have, but I think, as I said, they have tremendous remodeling potential because the medial phys is being open almost up to 20, 22 years. So I think over a period of time, do you do you you do get some lengthening? So uh, eventually, long term, if you see that, then I think we don't see so much of shortening and leading to any functional impairment because of shortening, not much. So when you say get I, uh, remodeling, so you actually think you get a little overgrowth, is that right? The name, meaning uh, more of the overgrowth and uh, angular correction also, that also may add to something about the remodeling and eventually getting the length. Dr. Can, I add, can I add something? Sure. I can. See, the social structure in India is very different from 
your country. So I have never come across any patient with a malunia complaining of any sort of functional disability. I mean, clavicle, if you treat non-operatively, almost always that will malunite. That's a known fact. I have never come across any patient who has ever complained of uh, any deformity except for a little bump there. And never ever I have come across any patient with who is complaining of a functional disability. And mine is a government hospital with a very high volume center. We are a very mm -hmm. high volume, both for children and adults. Only problem which uh, a lot of parents complain is a little bump at the fracture healing. And if you counsel them before that, look, this is going to form a little bone there, uh, in, especially in younger children. And this eventually will remodel over a period of time, and they're very happy. Dr. Binoti, do you do you uh, I'm share agree. the same thoughts you'll, with you'll me? Or, uh, you'll see that in a minute, you and I agree an awful lot. Uh, Dr. Sheth, let me just ask you the last couple of questions uh, quickly. What, what's your non-operative approach? Can you give us some tips on what to do? I mean, everybody knows how to take care of the little tiny thing with a little crack. But what do you do with these more displaced mid chaff ones that they're more tender? Do you use a, a sling, a figure of eight? Do you have any have any any yeah, any so, guidance? Yeah, so very young children, sometimes we use just a sling because what they need is just rest little. But little older children, we, we use a figure of eight or the clavicle brace. So and you think that helps to pull them out to length by using the figure of eight? Uh, just basically immobilize. Basically just give rest and, you know, take them in little. Not It's not going to reduce as we have for any forearm bones or we're not going to uh, aiming at reduction. It is just like externally, it's just stabilizing and uh, giving them pain relief. Okay, great. All right. Well, so, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, there's been a growing interest in uh, surgery and, uh, and these uh, clavicle fractures. And this all came out of the, or largely led by the Canadian Orthopedic Society. They had a, 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 a controlled randomized uh, study and a uh, fairly good sized group of patients um, that uh, they show that they healed earlier, but when you, and also some slight improvement in patient reported outcomes, but even they admit that it's, that, that applies to a fairly specific group of, kid, of people. If you look at the PEDS literature, um, uh, open reduction 1.5% of, uh, of the clavicle fractures, I think that's probably even a little high, uh, no non-unions. Uh, they had a number of uh, minor complications really, um, and uh, they claim minor complications. And when you look at the outcomes, look at this, 50% are pain-free. Well, that means 50% of the ORIFs have pain, 30% required hardware removal, and only 60% were satisfied. So um, I think that the, uh, the, even the articles who argue in favor of uh, operative treatment in kids uh, have a tough time doing so. So I'm part of a uh, group, Crystal and I are part of FACTS, uh, which is a, a multi-center group trying to look at, uh, uh, at uh, clavicle fractures. And uh, one of the first things we came up with was uh, just what Dr. Sheth talked about, the need to sort of have a universal approach to uh, how we're measuring them. Because if you measure them end to end, it can be very confusing because the fracture is often oblique. So that's where this cortex to cortex thing. And if you really want to know what's going on, you really need to go clavicle to clavicle. And um, the second tip I'll give you is that, uh, and that's the reason I was curious about your figure of eight and everything else, is that uh, waiting makes a big difference. That you'd be surprised over the first two to three weeks uh, how much uh, the muscles relax and you'll get less shortening than you saw originally. So if you're thinking about operating just because of, um, uh, of length, you may wanna wait a little while. And, and you know, I've never had trouble. I, I don't operate on very many clavicles, but when I have, it's never been a problem to pull them out to length. So with all this has come some nice new tools, and I think these are particularly handy for some distal clavicles, uh, where you get into some really tr pro problematic fractures, uh, but really in, um, in uh, mid-shaft, not so much. So in this particular one, this swimmer, I chose to manage her with this product. And I'm, not, I'm not paid by any of these companies to promote this, but we use this, uh, um, uh, it's called a dual track made by Acumet. It's a titanium um, a screw that's got uh, a variable pitch so that you can, uh, you can get some uh, compression. And here you can see we've got this thing nicely closed. This is a skinny girl, high, high performance athlete. I didn't wanna have anything very prominent. I'm not going to go through the whole idea, but basically you, you retrograde out 
and then you have an inserting device and you bring your screw from in uh, from the back edge of the clavicle and you take advantage of this flat spot between the two S's. And uh, that's where your uh, device goes. Here she is uh, three months down the line, back to full activities, still a little cortex still being filled in, but you can see she's got solid healing on the bottom here. So we looked at our patients. We found 24 patients, average 15 years of age. We had four, a little bit like what you were seeing there where they, they discharged themselves before they had complete cortical healing, uh, but none of these patients uh, came back and had any problems. They all returned to uh, sports and activities. Um, a surprising to me was that almost a quarter of them still have some pain with carrying things. And that's the reason I picked uh, the, uh, this on this girl, figuring they didn't want anything over that, uh, that clavicle. And one patient with uh, sort of chronic pain, but didn't want to have any treatment. Mine, of course, was the worst patient of the group. I had a, a low-grade uh, a, um, a propioni bacteria acne infection and uh, went on to a non-union. We've ultimately plated it and it, uh, it did well. Um, I've had a couple of patients. Here's a kid I saw recently with a comminuted angulated uh, uh, fracture and um, had persistent pain. And it's just what uh, Dr. Gupta was talking about, about this lump. And so I, uh, uh, this kid really complained bitterly. And when I went back and explored it, you can see here's one of the supraclavicular nerves uh, draped right over the uh, fracture site. And actually, as I dissected further over, there was a second one that was likewise draped over it. I've also had one where it was actually entrapped beneath a spike. So I took all these out, I burred down the bone, and, um, and here's what it looked like when we were finished. And a nice smooth contour, got rid of the lump and uh, completely relieved his pain. So the, um, so the nice part, the point I'm trying to make is that even if you leave them uh, with this bump that Dr. Uh, Gupta was talking about, uh, and if, even if they have trouble, you can always fix it later through a much smaller operation with uh, really relatively little problems. And here, Dr. Uh, Sheff talked about segmental fracture. Here's a segmental fracture that was significantly shortened and came to me. Look at the, look at the deformity. You don't necessarily see uh, looking straight on at them or necessarily see on the x-ray. And uh, look at the asymmetry of the neck and the shoulder. Um, so this is a patient where here's your segmental fracture. And this was one of the unusual indications I thought that I thought was helpful to plate this thing. So use a long plate, got them back out to length. And now I think you can see I restored the uh, symmetry on this uh, very thin boy where I think it would be very obvious if you'd left them like that. So in spite of uh, the adults telling us we ought to operate on more of these, uh, I think that uh, uh, the other thing is the literature showing deficits in kids is, uh, is not very good. So um, Dr. Gupta, you're completely right there. Uh, ORIF is not as rosy as you might think. Uh, there's a lot of pain afterwards. The patient's still complaining. Um, complications of closed management are largely manageable. Um, open fracture, rare issue, but that would be a good. Neurovascular injury, rare, but good. Skin compromise, occasionally you see some of those, but I've managed to get away with those a few times. Shortening, I'd let the muscle spasm settle down. Angulation, probably not an indication all by itself. Um, actually, I forgot uh, the segmental fracture in the multi-trauma patient, Dr. Uh, Sheth, you're completely right. And then occasionally we see these high demand uh, athletes, which was sort of the indication here. And the IM screw, I'm not here to tell you to do that. I'm here to tell you that I think it's interesting. I think it's a, a definitely a possibility, uh, but I'd say we don't have any evidence for you yet to say that this is uh, definitely the way to go. With that, uh, I think um, we have maybe uh, one minute uh, and we need to turn the program back over. Anybody, any final questions or comments about uh, clavicle fractures in kids? Okay, thank you. Over to you, Sandeep, for a vote of thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Zitin Bhai. So I, I think it was uh, really a wonderful 90 minutes, uh, really well spent. Uh, we discussed some interesting common fractures and some not so common. And uh, we learned uh, different ways of approaching it. It was uh, really lovely to see Stephen show the uh, way he does open reduction for fracture neck of the femur. Because uh, people still rely on close reduction quite a lot. And the highlights was... What he pointed out is, is the accuracy of reduction and decompression of the tamponade, which are prerequisites. And uh, in the older kid, it's useful to have a side plate rather than only screws because they're heavier. I, I guess a pediatric DHS uh, 
is uh, the implant of choice really and uh, michael was brilliant in his concept of uh, quad nailing which was something of an eye opener i am sure i in fact i received a couple of comments from my friends from gujarat who were overjoyed that somebody else in the world is using stainless steel nails and stacking the canal rather than doing the helix or the uh, uh, sort of spring that the titanium nail does so i, I know why dhiran bhai invited you now because of the enders <laughs> and, and, and and its modifications so right. thank you very much for that and a lovely overview of the clavicle fractures so like everybody people are cutting the uh, the, the the adolescent fracture has become really a controversial topic because they are neither here nor there i'm sure in younger kids less than 10 years everybody would conserve clavicle fractures but it's the older kid who has a high demand and the size the morphology of the kid sometimes you have 11 12 year old kids who are really huge uh, in india we don't have such huge kids yet uh, with improving nutrition we'll get there so it's also interesting to learn about how various methods can be used to fix clavicle fractures but i guess we'll have to be judicious and still the jury is not out as to which is the superior method of treatment of clavicle fractures and thank you crystal for your cases on ankle and the capitulum shear fractures and uh, it was very illustrative and interesting to note that you can do it from posterior approach because most of us have been doing it through the anterolateral and we do find the trajectory of the herbert screw to be a little not perpendicular to the fracture when we go from front so maybe it would be easier to pass the screw if you are doing it from behind so thank you very much gentlemen and ladies and uh, i cannot forget my indian friends dr gupta and binoti who's written a wonderful book on pediatric trauma recently so thank you guys for contributing to this wonderful uh, webinar on pediatric fractures and good night everyone thank you Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Jagan, you can stop recording.